Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for, for being here. Uh, Representative Cedric Frazier, I am a co-chair of uh, the Posse Caucus this year, and I want to thank my co-chair, uh, Representative Esek Baje, and our vice chair, Representative Kalowski, uh, for the great leadership and the hard work that we put in to this session as we near the end here in the, uh, the final few hours that we have today as we're going to be on the floor passing our last final uh, budget bills. Um, we're excited about that. We started this session off, um, and we were very, very focused and very intentional um, and very explicit about the focus of having, about the idea of having a focus on the issues that affect um, posse communities across the state of Minnesota. And what I want to emphasize is that posse issues are Minnesota issues. When we focus on these issues, we, we often talk about the disparities that we have around our state. And I often say that when we, when we have these surveys about the best states to live in, the best states to raise your families, the best state to have an education, the best places for a job, Minnesota always ranks very high. But when you drill down on those numbers, what we find is that there are stark disparities. And in and, and most cases, the folks you see up here, our communities, we represent the communities that fall within those disparities. And so what we're always trying to do is how do we fix those disparities? Because when we fix those disparities, we have better communities. So we led the session off focused on education. We know that when we have better educational outcomes, we have better communities. We know that when we have health equity, we have better community. We know that when we have public safety and criminal justice reform, we have better communities. We know that when we, we have equity and economic development, we create jobs and we have better community. We have achieved many of the goals that we set forth this session. And you'll hear from some of our members that will talk specifically to those bills. I wanted to get us kicked off. I also want to thank um, our leaders from the Senate side, um, Senator Kunish, who will speak next. And then we'll set back and we'll take questions from you all. But thank you all for being here. And we look forward to the conversation this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Senator Mary Kunish, District 39, and I can't tell you how excited I am to be here this morning to share all of the wonderful, incredible, life-transforming um, legislation that we have done here together, together with the House and the governor, to make sure that our communities have those resources that they need to thrive. As the chair of Education Finance, um, who could have asked for a better target of 5.2 billion dollars to take to our schools in order to ensure that those students, those classrooms, and those teachers have the resources that they need? Um, in education, we um, started, we created an ethnic studies uh, curriculum that is going to help our students understand each other better, build that awareness within our communities, and I'm so excited that Senator Swadzinski was able to do that. Uh, we um, have Indigenous Peoples Day. We're allowing our students to wear eagle feathers at graduation and wear their sacred tobacco. Those are just some of the simple little things that we are doing for our communities of, co of color, as well as non-exclusionary discipline and, um, of course, the new literacy program so that all of our students are reading at their age-appropriate way. These are just some of the things that we ha are, um, have been able to do, and I would want to give a shout out to um, Senator Fate's uh, uh, college for everyone, free tuition for those that, that uh, make the, um, the grade, because we know that our kids of color have had not only the lowest uh, high school graduation rates, but also the lowest college graduation rates. And this was an intentional way to ensure that they are going to thrive just the way the rest of us have. There's so much more in the bills that we have around public safety, so limits on no-knock war warrants by um, Senator Umu Verbaden and that bias crime bill by Senator Muhammad. Uh, healthcare, we were intentional about making sure Sure that our communities, especially our communities of color that have had the worst health care outcomes, are getting those supports. So we have the paid family uh, leave uh, um, authored by Senator Mann in the Senate and Minnesota Care for all of our undocumented um, Minnesotans as well. We uh, will continue to do the work and ensure that our environment is uh, a safe environment, that environmental justice is at the core of the work that we do. And we can't thank Senator Hur enough for his 
tireless work in advocating for not just Minnesota's environmental issues, but also the impacts that it has on our folks of color. There's so much more that we, um, we have been working on along with um, ensuring that our first homeowners um, have uh, the assistance because those, uh, those folks that have been left out of the, of the, um, the opportunity for home ownership, and we know that home ownership is the first step in generational wealth building, now have that opportunity along with those manufactured homes um, that are probably the most affordable uh, form of, uh, of housing at this point. So we, um, I think we're just all a little overwhelmed, absolutely giddy with the work that has been done here. Uh, there is a sense of one more day, one more bill, um, and we will continue to do this work, uh, not just this year, but uh, next year. We're just at that halfway part, and so uh, we'll start building our plans for next year. But we thank you all for your, um, your time and your interest and your support, and I can't thank all of these people behind me more than, than um, anything else. And now we have Dr. Corey who would like to make a, a, a few messages. Uh, good morning, uh, my name is Dr. Bruce Corey. I'm an economist at Concordia University and member of the Alana African American Latino Asian Native American Brain Trust. I've engaged with the political system before the campaign, during the campaign, into this legislative session, and now the finish line. And to summarize what is done, had happened in two minutes is an impossible task. I'm going to try what to do no. best. Thank you, co-chairs, for inviting me. The great leadership of our Alana legislators and chairs, they fought very hard for the needs of the community. I saw this from the sidelines when tough challenges were addressed with persistence and strategy. I also appreciate the leadership of the House and Senate for sharing power with Alana leaders. This is a very unique Minnesota success story. Uh, on the part of Alana legislators, such as Representative Hussein, Mohammed Fah, and others that I've seen, they brought ordinary people into the legislature, passed bills without lobbyists, and that's another big story. The denial of value of a human being and their cultural assets is foundational to systems of oppression and exploitation all over the world. This legislative session brought out some foundational changes in this area in a number of areas. The Crown Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous and African Women and Girls Act, the Driver's License for All Bill, the American Indian Family Preservation Act, the Ethnic Studies Act, all of them began the healing and restoration process. Alana legislators out here were chief authors in many of these bills. In the areas of wealth building, Alana chairs like Hassan Shang, Champion, Kunesh, Hao, Becca Finn, Lee, Her, Champion, and others uh, made foundational changes in education, housing, healthcare, public safety, taxes, and redefined the wealth building strategy in Minnesota. The Job Com Conference Committee, for instance, shifted the focus to micro businesses, and you can see the power of it when you go to cultural malls. Same way the Labor Jobs Bill with uh, Chair Zhang shifted the focus to uh, small community-based organizations to uh, uh, power this meeting the critical labor shortages in Minnesota. And then in the labor bill, we find the uh, protection of long sought rights of workers in meatpacking and warehouse conditions and affirming the important role that they play to bring food to the table in Minnesota. Our legislators have also played a role, as we just heard, from, in education from pre-K to high end and funding for private colleges through changes in language, through cultural intelligence in the classroom, and funding for Alana teachers and students to initiatives ranging from free college uh, and to funding of Alana teachers in agriculture bill, uh, the, ascend, the support for farmers by Chair Wang and the tax bill, mm -hmm. the working family credit, the child credit are important tools to address the challenging benefits, CLIP as a negative <laughs> incentive to economic stability, uh, and noted is the inclusion of people paying taxes through ITN numbers. Mm -hmm. um, now as workers get to keep more of their income, they have a pathway to financial independence. Changes in the health care coverage too will assist in this process. Here also Alana Lila, like Chair Gomez and Noor have played an important role. And data from the Minister of Housing shows that many of these programs are going to reach Alana renters and homeowners, community land trusts and other areas. 
and, and a number of bills, there's been an investment in, a, in the capacity building of nonprofits and legislators like Representative Senator Muir and others played an important role. Left a very important, there's a foundational shift in state contracting. I've been working on this for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. Foundational shift that we find that the preference from the com uh, for, that the commissioner can grant uh, uh, from 6% to 12% to targeted communities and the minimum bid uh, where uh, you can award contracts as exemption has gone from 25,000 to 100,000. This will do a dramatic shift in, in, in getting economic, uh, the engine of economic of entrepreneurship growing. In the cannab cannabis bill, the uh, uh, expungement of criminal records, the creation of space for micro entrepreneurs, and the intentionality to ensure we do not create canna cannabis oligopolies, oligopolies in Minnesota. And finally, I want to point out the global impact of what's happening right now, because right now in Paris, there are Minnesotans meeting with African uh, and other uh, uh, ambassadors. And the world out there sees Minnesota, they see uh, the murder of an innocent man on the street, and that's the image of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. But what they are seeing right now is what you have uh, done. They're seeing, they point, can point out the great advances and how they can align with the international goals, including the Paris Climate Accords, with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals related to healthcare and well-being. We're trying to bring the World Expo to Minnesota in 2027. And these are very powerful messages that we are doing things in healthcare, reproductive rights, talent and workforce development, road safety, and so on. So Minnesota is going to see us with a new light thanks to this foundational world. And I went too fast, a lot to cover. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. As you have heard, um, thank you for that wonderful summary, Dr. Br Dr. Corey. We've done a lot. And we did it by ensuring that we were focused on inclusivity and breaking down the systemic barriers that black and brown Minnesotans face here every day. We focused on investing in our communities to, as you heard, protect our housing, increase our access to education, keeping our communities safe, healthcare, and legalizing cannabis in a way that did not leave us behind because our, so many members of our communities have been hurt by the war on drugs. And with the upcoming capital investment bill that we'll be hearing later today, we also address some of the most, we've also done some of the most significant advancements for equity across the state. And a lot of those projects will address our food insecurity issues, they'll continue to preserve our diverse cultural communities, and they will continue to build a foundation for greater wealth building for black and brown Minnesotans. So this session is laying the groundwork for true transformation in Minnesota. And we are grateful to both our community partners who have seen the work that we're doing, who have been here with us, who've been advocating with us, who have been marching with us. Um, and we're also really grateful to our legislative partners. It's not just us up here, but we do have to do this in community and in concert with our other DFL colleagues. But now, BIPOC Minnesotans have a chance to have a real seat at the table. And this is only the beginning, and we're looking forward to more in the next session. So with that, we'll open to questions. And if you have specific questions, uh, we have different individual members here who can answer those. Senator Kunish, could you address you for a while? How much does the quality and quantity of the members around you matter and made such a difference this year? Um, it matters 100%. Uh, I think about six years ago when I came to the Minnesota legislature and we had a handful of folks of color in both of the bodies. And in that time in the House, it's more than tripled. And it shows in the legislation that is not only um, uh, introduced but passed. Uh, and we have more than doubled just last year in the Minnesota Senate, our, our uh, posse caucus. And so the quality of the bills, I think, has certainly uh, improved, but also the understanding and the education around what our communities of color, the generational and the historic trauma and, um, and struggle, uh, we brought to the forefront. And people are starting to understand that where before they didn't. And so with that uh, heightened awareness and um, understanding that our, color, our communities of color have been left behind, our, our other legislators are stepping up and they're realizing what a difference it makes to have those voices and they're willing to support us in the work that we're doing. Representative Frazier, maybe on the flip side, how many younger, newer members played such crucial roles in the Senate had freshman vice chairs, 
a lot of you with just a couple terms really rising in leadership. But that's unusual in the big scope of the Capitol. How much of a difference did it make, that new, young? I think leadership? it's made a huge difference. And that, that goes out. Uh, thank you again to Speaker Hortman for recognizing that uh, we have these young leaders that are coming in. We have voices from the next generations, the next leaders um, in the state of Minnesota, and putting them in positions to have an influence and impact on the policy that we're making at this level. It's, it's been tremendous. Um, what I've often said to folks is that uh, when I ran, I was the first uh, BIPOC person in my district to hold a seat in there. And what I said to young folks when I go out and I speak to them, I say, I'm coming in to knock the door off the hinges to ensure that it won't, I won't be the last, that the rest of you can come through as well. And I think we're seeing the quality in our policies. We're seeing the fingerprints all over the policy that we do for our state. And I think it's making a huge difference. And I know it's, it's definitely made an impact on the way we lead, mm -hmm. having the support of each other. And as Senator Cooney said, also having the support of our colleagues as well. There's a lot that you guys were able to accomplish this year. I mean, you guys listed it all during the press conference. But what is there left to do next year? Yeah, you know, as Representative just reminded us, this, this is definitely the floor. I mean, I think we have laid out what the baseline should look like to ensure that Minnesota is a much more inclusive and just state. Um, so I think we'll be looking at ways to continue the investments in our communities, to continue ensuring we have access to education to continue ensuring that we're not discriminating in our housing. Um, that's something that you know we weren't able to get across the finish line this year, but we're, we're focused on that next year. Um, wanting to make sure that as we stand up our new cannabis regulation that we're doing it in a way that continues to bring in communities of color. Um, I think you'll see in a variety of areas, as we've said, we have about 30 uh, BIPOC legislators across both the House and the Senate. There's plenty of ideas that will still be coming forward, so I think you'll, you'll continue to see a lot of good things from us. If I can just add to that, I think, you know, we did, the disparities that we see in our state didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen in a couple of years. So the work to climb out and close those disparities, it will take the next several years, decades, to make sure we do that. I think we've set the pace right now as a group, um, ourselves, our colleagues, to um, start going toward that path to close these disparities. So it'll be a constant work in progress to make sure we don't turn back and we keep moving forward. And one thing I, I didn't get a chance to speak, and I saw Senator Fatah made it, is that uh, we had a big focus on ensuring protection for workers and labor oh, this yeah. session, mm -hmm. right? And what you all saw yesterday is the Senate passed the Uber Lyft bill to ensure that those workers would have protections in place. So that's, that was a big deal for us. Um, you saw the workers here. They were here day and night um, uh, bringing us energy to make sure we got that done. So we're looking forward to the governor um, signing that bill and moving it forward. Committed to signing that bill because I thought his office said that they're still reviewing it. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Fate, um, District 62, South Minneapolis. I have been in contact with the governor's Maybe. office, and I believe he'll do the right thing. But no commitment yet. I'm still in communications with the governor's office. Oh, oh yes. Um, so about a month ago, before the bill passed, um, we sat with the governor's staff. Uh, we walked them through the bill. And they made a commitment at that time uh, that they would uh, sign the bill had, if it goes through the House and the Senate. Now that we're at that stage, I would like to see them um, keep their promise um, that they made to us and the workers and the drivers that have been showing up day in and day out, as Representative Frazier has said. Because they took a lot of time out to organize, time away from their families, sacrifices for each other. Um, th these are long hours that they could have been taking to do their job, to drive for Uber and Lyft. And that's a lot of lost wages. And every dollar counts for them when you're, when you're struggling to make ends meet. Uh, and by the way, uh, when we were fighting for them, uh, yesterday I mentioned on the floor that Uber doesn't provide any of the resources or Lyft. Uh, the drivers pay for the car, they pay for the gas, they pay for the insurance. Everything associated with the business they pay for. After all that's covered, then, they start then they're uh, able to pay what, whatever is left uh, for their food, for their families, for themselves. And we thought that was immoral, and that's one of the reasons why we stepped up. Um, last year, uh, the, when this initiative or this effort first started, uh, me, Representative Hona Hassan, Representative uh, Hussein Zainab, as well as Representative Noor were invited by the drivers to speak uh, and hear from them about the issues that they were having with Uber and Lyft. Myself, I was expecting maybe a roundtable discussion. And when I came, there was about 500 drivers <laughs> that showed up. Um, and uh, keeping in contact with them every single day, learning about their stories. Some have been shot, killed family members killed, 
um, has been heartbreaking. And in the last decade, as uh, Uber has, and Lyft has been enjoying record profits, record revenues, the wages has just been declining uh, every, single, every single year. And we think that's, that's immoral. Um, these drivers are responsible uh, for the record profits that they're having. Uh, the, the drivers, I've been hearing from them every single day. Uh, there's, I think, an association of about 1,200 drivers right now. There's a WhatsApp group with about 1,000 of them. I should know because someone put my number in there and they started calling me. <laughs> which, which, which is okay, it comes with it, but um, I'm really glad to see this come across the finish line. Thank you. Well, you were able to pass a lot of your priorities at policing this session, especially ones that had been blocked for a few legislative sessions. I was wondering if you could touch on that, but also, were there some big priorities of yours over the last several cycles that you feel like you were not able to get through, even with the DFL-controlled legislature? Um, I'd have to remember all the things over the several years that kind of were, were big key priorities, but I wondered if there's stuff that's still sort of on the table that you're working on in that realm. Thanks for the question. I think from the, from the, uh, you know, the criminal justice and the police and accountability um, area, we are, you know, come on up, Chair Baker Finn. Um, <laughs> Chair Baker Finn was the chair of our <laughs> Judiciary Committee. Um, but, you know, I think we were able to get things done because, you know, elections matter. And Minnesotans elected uh, representatives um, to represent them that had the same values in terms of accountability. And, and when I mentioned earlier, you know, we, when we're trying to create safe communities, um, trust and accountability is a big part of that. There was nothing we did in our bills that are an attack on any of law enforcement. Um, my conversations with law enforcement say, hey, we want to make sure that we are accountable. We want to make sure that the community trusts us. And the legislation that we have in our bills um, specifically do that. And we're hoping we can build a trust between community because when we have that trust between community and law enforcement, I always talk about that sacred oath to serve and protect. When we have that trust and we have officers living up to that sacred oath, we have safer communities because people won't be afraid to call, people won't be afraid to communicate, and people will trust that when they call law enforcement, it's, they're going to be there to keep them safe. I think this is a great opportunity, too, to lift up um, the, the fact that, you know, all the attention was on the, the two gun bills that were on in the omnibus bill, but we finally got the no-knock warrant uh, yeah. provision through, um, you know, thanks to the work of Athena Hollins, and we actually had a first-term member, uh, a former officer who was our lead on that, uh, Representative Brian Curran. Uh, so I think, you know, there's always going to be things that we can do better, and, you know, as things happen in our community and we learn more ways that we can make our communities safer, I think we'll, we'll continue to do that work. I do think, you know, we did some, again, we kind of laugh about how often we've used the word transformational, but when you do big, huge transformational things, I'm sure there will sort of be some tweaking and things we can do to make sure that that's followed through and carried out in the way that it was intended um, when we pass those things, whether it's the MRA or the investments in community, you know, making sure all those things are followed through in the way that we intended um, when we got them across the finish line. What it means to see a growing number of people from the BIPOC community represented in uh, the state legislature. What do you think it means for Minnesotans that we're seeing those lawmakers be elected more and more across the state? I'll go. I, 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 I think it means that uh, Minnesota, the, the representatives that we have here now are truly reflecting what Minnesota looks like. I think that's what we're saying. Dr. Dr. Corey talked about this, um, about what Minnesota may be known for right now in this moment, is seeing uh, George Floyd murdered in the middle of the street on camera. We're trying to change that narrative. All the work that we're trying to do here is we want people to know that Minnesota is better than that and that we have the representatives here to make sure that Minnesota will be the greatest state, the best state for all those in the state, no matter what you look like, no matter what your zip code is, no matter what the color of your skin is. We want folks to know that this state will be a state that will be the best state for you. I think it's key, too, that, um, you know, we have everyone from people who were born in other countries and yeah. are, are refugees who came to our country uh, to indigenous folks uh, representing rural Minnesota and our home communities up north. Um, so I think one of the key things about this Posse Caucus, and I, I was one of the, it's kind of weird to be, like, <laughs> one of the elder Posse Caucus members <laughs> only in my, like, third term, but, our, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, my fourth term, and it's, I think the key thing
thing too is that I think historically our communities have been able, the folks all up here, um, the powers outside of us have been able to divide us mm -hmm. and none of us up here have allowed that to happen. We've had each other's backs, um, you know, on the individual issues that are mm -hmm. uh, impacting our individual communities and I think that's really key and I think that, that to me, I hope is the message and the vision that our young people are seeing that we, even if we come from completely different backgrounds that when we share values, we can do this work together. And so I think that's a really key piece of this as far as what our young folks and newer uh, newer members of Minnesota uh, are seeing about what our state's all about. Do you think this will inspire more young people of color to run? You know, this believe it, you see it. Are you, are you hearing that anecdotally? Do you have evidence? I mean, I, I grew up on the res. So I mean, I, you know, I graduated with 35 people in rural Minnesota. And I mean, that's what I talk about a lot is it, it doesn't, you don't have to be some magical special person to do this work. Um, we're all kicking those doors down every single day. And um, I, I know that's what our kids see. I know too, um, especially in the last couple of weeks over the weekends, we've, a lot of us have had our kids in these buildings. Our kids know they belong here and other kids are seeing our kids um, in these spaces. And I think that's um, incredibly powerful. And I, I know that it's gonna make a difference. You just to add to that, I mean, we're, we are, we want to make sure we norm normalize to our young people that you can be here, you can be standing right here where we are making change in this state. You know, one of the things, usually when I get invitations to come somewhere to speak, the, the main place that I don't turn down is our schools. I always go to our schools and I talk to our young people because I want them to see us and I want them to know that they can be here too. Uh, a lot of you mentioned George Floyd. Is it fair to characterize some of this transformation as flowing from, flowing from that? I think I, I can speak on that. Go, go on yeah. I mean, I knew George Floyd, and if we didn't make a difference after what we've seen, and not just with George Floyd, but all the names that have been taken away by the injustices due to the systemic powers that be, we wouldn't be here today in such a force. Uh, it's, it's a domino effect, all right? We're changing those poisons into medicines of healing, and you're seeing doctors of law through an elected certificate from different backgrounds and ensuring that all of our kids and all of our families are feeling welcomed and empowered. All right. um, I think we can take one more question. Anyone has one? All right. Has one. Can I just ask, does anyone know about the tribal uh, aid? I think it's $35 million in the tax bill. Does that operate just like local government aid? Can is someone an expert on that? Can yeah. Talk about it? Um, people can add more to it as well. But um, on the tax committee, that was a big priority for us. We wanted to make sure that um, we were supporting our tribal nations. Um, in, in a similar fashion that we uh, support our counties and our, and our municipalities. And so that was very important to us to, to get that in there and to make sure that that's ongoing funding as well. All right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, and Senior Thank Commissioner. You. Oh, I was just going to say that um, when you look at the investment that Minnesota has, our state government and our finance to our Native communities, it has been um, shockingly uh, negligent. And that aid that you're talking about is going to allow those communities to build the infrastructure that most Minnesotans enjoy. Uh, uh, they're the water, the sewer, the housing, the roads, the public safety, everything else that our public dollars go to, to our other communities, have not been going to those communities. And now with that, um, those are indigenous communities of the reservations will be able to um, have the same quality of life that everybody else uh, uh, enjoys here. And I would say it's long, long overdue. And I know that with these investments, just as we've been talking about a better Minnesota going forward, this will absolutely make Minnesota better, not just for our, our tribal nations, but the surrounding communities that they interact in, that they participate in and support as well. So that is one of the, I, I think, perhaps one of the, the biggest successes this session. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Appreciate it. Forget that groovy.